Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Walk in the Light devotional. My name is Elder Jensen. And my name is Elder Fellows. And we're super excited to be here with you tonight as we're privileged to hear from Hank Smith. As the event gets started and people are joining in, let us know in the comments where you are tuning in from and tag a friend with whom you'd like to watch. Before we introduce Hank, we would like to start off the event with an opening musical number by Bertlin Orgel, Annika Quick, and Chandler Hatch. Following that, I will be offering the opening prayer. time and may feel the spirit as we listen to him and guide us and protect us throughout the day and watch over everyone around us and all these guys came in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for that musical number and thank you Angelo for that great prayer. As we've already mentioned tonight, to, we are going to be joined by Hank Smith. He will show, share with us how he walks in the light of Jesus Christ. Hank Smith grew up in St. George, Utah. He served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in California, has an MBA from the Utah State University, and a PhD from Brigham Young University, where he is now a faculty member in the religion department. Hank and his wife, Sarah, and their five children live in Mapleton, Utah. He says, Sarah's incredible. She knows everything about me and still loves me. Hank enjoys running marathons and eating out, which is why he runs marathons. He has spoken throughout the country for school districts, corporations, and hundreds of public school assemblies. Hank has published multiple talks on CD with Deseret Book. He's left us with a word of caution. Please do not drive while listening to his CDs. Studies show that sleeping while driving irritates other drivers. Listen and drive at your own risk. Thanks for joining us tonight, Hank. The time is all yours. Thank you so much, elders. Thank you, everyone who is listening tonight. Thank you for joining us. My goodness, uh, this is just a joy. Isn't technology absolutely 
amazing that all over the world uh, we can be tuning in together and sharing the light, sharing such an, such uplifting messages. And I'm excited to share one with you tonight. Now, <clears throat> I need to tell you something in order to introduce my topic tonight. Uh, just two uh, weeks ago, 15 days ago, uh, my father, uh, 77 years old, passed away. Um, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, and it has been a difficult um, two weeks. However, I have to tell you that my testimony of Jesus Christ has been my lifeline. It has been uh, a sustaining force through what has been a very difficult trial, a very difficult time, a, a, you know, a, a rough time of life. And I, I just can't think of any way to start this other than to tell you um, that the Savior's light has given me joy over the last 15 days. I know that sounds odd. I know that sounds, you're like, what? It doesn't make any sense. And I know it doesn't make any sense, but it has given me profound gratitude and joy uh, as I've, you know, uh, as I've moved forward uh, through this. So I, I wanted to start out with that. Now, um, I'm going to share my screen here with you uh, because I do want to share with you uh, the uh, the joys of my life. Um, let me share this. Uh, let me share this with you. All right. You could probably see that. Okay. This is my beautiful, amazing bride, Sarah. I almost worship her. Uh, it is this close to idolatry. Um, I just absolutely adore this woman. Uh, a few years into our marriage, we had a little baby girl. This is her. Um, she is uh, the light of our world. Uh, for a while, it was just the three of us. Um, and that was an odd time of life to, to look back on because you thought you were busy. And now with the children we have now, we can look back at our time of our lives then and say, you weren't even close to busy. This is Madeline now. She's a teenager and she uh, is a, a bundle of joy. She also uh, makes life very difficult for us sometimes. Uh, and I think uh, that's pretty typical of, of people her age, but she's doing her best. She loves the Lord and she, she wants to, you know, she wants to live a life dedicated to him. This is our second child right here. Uh, we, for a long time, we didn't know if he had a neck. Uh, he's a very big baby. Um, uh, this is the day he is born. I am not kidding. The day he is born. That is his sister holding him. Uh, she's two and a half years old and she is holding a newborn baby. He, he just kept growing. This is the next day right here. Just kidding. It wasn't the next day. It was a couple days later, but uh, these two are uh, are pretty close friends and uh, pretty uh, close enemies. Um, Mason now uh, is a lot taller than he uh, was in that previous picture. Uh, he is a six foot one now. He has a size 14 inch shoe and um, he thinks he is God's gift to girls. Uh, so uh, do any of you know someone who thinks they are God's gift to the opposite sex? Uh, because uh, they could come and, and meet my son and they could they could compete. Uh, this is our third child. Uh, he never looked like this. He mostly looked like this. Uh, just kind of a, a, a upset kid. He's my redhead. I think, uh, I think God marks the redheads. I don't know if you know a redhead, but I think God marks them and says, this one's got a feisty spirit. Uh, he is uh, difficult. I love him. Uh, and when he's asleep, uh, life is very easy. When he's awake, um, I, I, I'm, <laughs> he's wonderful. He's wonderful. I'll just say that. Uh, we wanted to have four children. Uh, and we had a girl and a boy and a boy, and we thought, what, how big, great would it be if we had a girl? Uh, and so we uh, went to the doctor to see our, our baby number four, uh, and it wasn't a girl. It was two more boys. Um, yes, we got two more boys. We already had two boys, uh, my daughter said. Uh, she said, we already have two boys. Why would God do this to us? And I said, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, she started to cry. Uh, this is uh, another picture of them. Watch that one on the right. His face doesn't change. It should change, but it doesn't change. I, 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 I was asking the doctors. I said, is that one okay? And they said, we don't know. Take it home. So we took him home and uh, eight months later, his face 
had not changed. It's the exact same face. Uh, there was one day uh, my wife said, I know who he looks like. I said, who? And she said, Megamind. Um, he looks exactly like <laughs> Megamind. Um, we have Megamind as a child, little blue food coloring, and he's got a Halloween costume. Uh, now, uh, I bring this up because a lot of you listening are in families, and something that our church uh, really uh, focuses on is the family unit, uh, and this is us. Now, you might look at this picture and say, oh, they are such a happy family, and we are. We are a happy family, but we have our fair share of problems and arguments uh, and difficulties, especially that little redhead on the right, right? He's smiling as he plots all of our demise. So, um, I, I tell you this not to sh say, hey, look, uh, we have a perfect family, uh, but to show you that family is really where it's at. Uh, it is where joy is. I've been able to travel the world in my job as a public speaker, um, and uh, it's been fun. Traveling has been nice. Uh, but uh, if I were to say where I'd rather be, it would to be uh, with these little people, watching them grow up. There's a joy there that's just not found anywhere else. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a mother or a father. You can also be part of a family as an aunt or an uncle uh, or a daughter or a son. Uh, but really, this is where true joy and true light is found. In fact, one of our Latter-day Saint leaders, her name is Julie Beck. She's one of my heroes. She said this. She said, if it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. Uh, and I would wholeheartedly agree. If something is anti-family, uh, it is anti-Christ. We uh, say that the light of the Savior uh, takes us to our families. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't say that we should ever enable any sort of abuse. Um, that is not. That is also anti-Christ because it is anti family. Um, now, uh, in a couple of days, we are going to celebrate Easter. And uh, around the world, um, there's going to be a lot of chocolate eaten. Uh, and a lot of Easter, Easter baskets and Easter eggs are going to be hidden. And it's going to be a joyful time, especially in the northern hemisphere, uh, as uh, the seasons change, as it gets, uh, you know, goes from uh, warm, or it goes from cold to warm, right? We, I love that seasonal change. In fact, you know, you feel like 50 degrees, uh, I'm here in Utah, at 50 degrees in November is cold, but 50 degrees in March is basking in the sunshine, right? Um, everybody wants it to warm up. It's been a long, uh, difficult winter. Well, every time I see uh, the trees start to grow their leaves again, or to see flowers come out of the ground. Every time I think of a quote from Martin Luther. Now think closely on this. He said, our Lord has written the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. Think about it. If, if the Lord, if God wanted us to know that we live after we, we, after we die, uh, how would he tell us? Right? How would he tell us? Outside of, of course, scripture, prophets, right? How would he tell us? Well, I think he would build it in to the seasons. Um, and he would say, look, look at the world. It looks dead, doesn't it? Look at that tree. It looks dead. You wouldn't think that's alive. Look at that. Look at that ground. It looks barren, doesn't it? And then every spring, it comes back to life. How many witnesses, if this is true, how many witnesses of the resurrection do we have? millions, billions, every springtime, we have all these witnesses that that which was once dead uh, will live will live again. Now, in our Bible dictionary, there's an important statement. This is going to be my thought for tonight. Uh, it defines miracles. Uh, it says, miracles are an important element in the work of Jesus Christ. Yes, they are being not only divine acts, but also part of the way he taught. I teach the Bible at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, and in Provo, Utah. And uh, this is uh, absolutely true, that the Savior used miracles to teach people lessons, not just to do magic tricks, but to actually teach important lessons. Now listen to this next sentence. Christianity is founded on the greatest of all miracles. What is the greatest of all of his miracles? He did a lot of them. He walked on water. He fed 5,000. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. What was, what was the greatest of his miracles? Christianity is founded on the greatest of all miracles, the resurrection of our Lord. His resurrection is his greatest of all miracles. In fact, it is, um, it is a game changer. Uh, it makes Jesus Christ different than any other uh, teacher or leader who had ever lived. Right? Many leaders had come and gone and they'd even changed the world, but none of them had come back to life. 
Now look at this last sentence, and I love this one. I hope I can I hope I can make it come across in the right way. If that be admitted, meaning if you and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which I do, and I hope you do as well, other miracles cease to be improbable. Uh, look at that last little statement. Other miracles cease to be improbable. What I think this is saying is that if you and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we're truly saying, and I'm okay with this, I hope you are, is that we believe a man, Jesus of Nazareth, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, died. And he was dead, dead. Heart dead, brain dead. He was dead. No, three days. Nothing was happening. And then three days later, he got up. He got up. Not only that, right? Now, that's an incredible belief. That's not something that happens every day. You're not going to say, well, that happened to my Aunt Edda. No, no. I, there's nobody that I know of who has been dead for three days and then come back and without any help whatsoever, right? No one was there clear, right? No, it just, he comes back. I believe it. And so do you. But it's a, it's a pretty big belief. Second, we believe that he'll never die again. Now, that's a, that's a big time belief. Do you see how, why we call this a game changer? He'll never die again. That is quite a claim, yet you and I believe it. And then the last one, which is probably my favorite, is that we believe this man who was dead and came back to life, uh, who will never die again, can leave the planet and come back whenever he wants. That's quite a belief. Not only that, but if we read the Bible in Acts chapter one, it says he ascends. Oh, apparently he can levitate. He can fly. Now you might say that's too much for me. I can't believe it, right? It's too outrageous, but I am all in. I believe that what everything we just talked about is true. Now here's this last statement. Look at it again. If I admit that, if I believe that other miracles cease to be improbable, uh, some of you might be learning the story of the prophet Joseph Smith. I have a friend who is a, a wonderful Christian, and unfortunately, he doesn't think me as a Latter-day Saint uh, uh, that I'm going to hell. You know, that's probably good to look for in a friend. Um, and uh, he said this to me once, and I, I kind of cornered him on it. Um, I said, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And she, he said, yeah. And I, and I went through all those things that I just went through with you. He was dead. He was, he came back to life. He'll never die again. And he said, yes, I believe it. I said, isn't that, isn't that kind of outrageous? And he said, um, he said, yeah, it is, but, but I totally believe it. And I said, so do I. And then I said, um, I said, why is the story of Joseph Smith too outrageous for you then? Because he said to me before, wow, I don't know. The story of Joseph Smith, a young boy, golden plates. Come on, isn't that a little outrageous? No, not at all, actually. It's not outrageous if you believe in the resurrection. It actually fits. It's not just impossible. It's quite probable. In fact, uh, a friend of mine once said, as we were talking about this very issue, he said, you know, I have learned to not look for Jesus in the likely if you read the Bible, he's never found in the likely events, walking on water, feeding 5,000. He's not found in the likely events. He said, I have learned to look for Jesus in the unlikely, in the things that sound a little outrageous, in the things that sound a little out there. That seems to be his MO. That seems to be where you, you can know that he is involved. Now, I'm not here to uh, to baptize anyone. I'm not here to uh, convert anyone. I'm here to just proclaim that the light of my life comes from this knowledge, the knowledge of the resurrection and the knowledge of the restoration of the gospel. I want to show you something that G. Han uh, Stanley Hall once said. He said, the most essential claim of Christianity is to have removed the fear of death and made the king of terrors. Death was the king of terrors before Jesus and even after him right? The thing that no one talks about, but everybody fears. Jesus took the king of terrors and made it a good friend and a boon companion. There's a uh, account in the resurrection or in the Bible, sorry, of the resurrection in John chapter 20, in which um, Mary, a disciple of Jesus, is at the tomb. She is sad because someone, she says, has stolen the body. Now, if you read... Um, if you read the original, shouldn't say the original, but if you read the Greek of this account, there's this moment where Jesus is standing behind her and he asks her, ma'am, you know, why are you crying? He could just pronounce that he's Jesus, but I like, I like learning about Jesus's personality here. He's, he's kind of setting up a big moment. Uh, and he says, ma'am, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? And she said, um, she thinks he's the gardener. 
uh, says, if you've taken him away, meaning, you know, you probably thought he didn't belong here in, the, in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. You probably took him away and um, took him over to the peasant's grave, but I, 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 he, he doesn't belong there. Please tell me where, and I will, I will go get the body. And then he says a word. And in, um, in that moment with this one word, her entire life changes. And what was the word? It was Mary. He calls her by name. Now, if you look at the Greek of this, it's actually a different form of Mary. It's, um, it's a nickname, uh, like, like Miri, Miriam. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a name of close affiliation. So let's say that I've got a friend named Elizabeth, uh, but I call her Bethy, right? Uh, and in that moment, he didn't say Elizabeth. He said, hey, Bethy. Do you see the, the, the close connection, the intimacy there of friendship? Now, that one word changed her entire life, changed her entire existence, right? Everything changes with that one word. And I want to promise you something. I promise you that you can have experiences in which you find out that the Redeemer of the world knows who you are. That he doesn't just know your name, like, hey, you're Hank, right? I've heard of you. No, he, he knows you closely. Uh, he knows your story. Uh, he knows why you do what you do. He understands you, probably more than you understand you. And you can have experiences where you know that is true. If you want to have those experiences, I would encourage you to find those missionaries closest to you and say, teach me how to have those experiences. Because as much as I might, I like Netflix and Amazon Prime and watching a good funny show, that nothing compares to having an experience with divinity. An experience where you find out that God is real, that the Savior is real, and that he knows you. Nothing compares to that. I mean, entertainment is fine and sports is fine and they're, and they're good. I'm happy that we have them. Uh, but they pale in comparison to having an experience with the divine. Let me finish um, with a quote from one of our church leaders. His name is uh, Thomas Monson. He passed away uh, a number of years ago. Um, for anyone who has, who like me, has lost someone they adore, who would love to see and talk and laugh with that person again. I give you this witness. He says, our Savior lived again. The most glorious, comforting, and reassuring of all events of human history had taken place. The victory over death. The pain and agony of Gethsemane and Calvary had been wiped away. The fall of Adam had been reclaimed. The empty tomb the first Easter morning was the answer to Job's question. If you read the Old Testament, there's a book of Job in which Job asked this question. If a man die, if a woman die, will they live again? To all within the sound of my voice, I declare, if a man die, he shall live again. If a woman die, she shall live again. In our hour of deepest sorrow, we can receive profound peace or light from the words of the angel that first Easter morning. He is not here, for he is risen. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for that message, Hank. Uh, I, I really love that, that message about the Savior and uh, truly brings me so much peace knowing that, um, that we have that, that sacrifice for us, that death isn't permanent and that uh, the sting of death has been removed by Christ. Yep. Truly one of the greatest gifts we have. We really appreciate the, the powerfulness of the testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I didn't quite think of it in that way. Um, so if it's okay with you, we're now just going to dive right into the question and answer. Absolutely. Awesome. We're going to get the first one pulled up then. And it is from Sierra Lynn Potter. And she asked, what experiences have helped you see that Christ knows you personally? Oh my goodness, Sierra. I mean, do we, ha how many hours do we have? Um, yeah, if we, everyone wants to meet me over on a different uh, Facebook page, we can go for hours. Um, I would uh, direct anyone with that question to uh, a talk that changed my life. 
Uh, it's from a man named David Bednar, uh, PhD out of Purdue, now a leader of our church, uh, in which he he gave a talk called The Tender Mercies of the Lord. Uh, the tender mercies of the Lord, he said, are the personalized blessings that we receive from Jesus Christ, where other people might not notice them, we notice them. We see them. And other people might say, wow, what a, what a coincidence, right? Uh, but you and I know that some things are not coincidence. Um, I will give you one that is very recent. Had my father passed away about 18 months ago, my family, my, my immediate brothers and sisters would have been in shambles. And I, I, I say that with because all of us have siblings who maybe just struggle along the way. And I, and I have one or two or three uh, who struggle along the way. And had my father passed away those 18 months ago, I, I can't imagine the disaster that it would have taken place. But for each of those three siblings, the last 18 months has completely changed their life. Uh, they are now, each of them, in a place where when my father passed away, they were okay. Not great, not perfect, but they were in a place where they would be okay. And there are no shambles as there would have been 18 months ago. Now, none of that had ever occurred in their life up till that point, up till 18 months ago. And some of these are, you know, 50, 50, my oldest was, my oldest brother's 50 something years old. They're each in a place where they could handle the death of my father. Now you might say, oh, what a nice coincidence. I would say the tender mercies of the Lord are real. Uh, they do not happen merely by coincidence. They happen because we have a Savior who loves us. So again, I would go and read that talk, The Tender Mercies of the Lord. You got to listen to him give it as well. If you can find a copy of it on YouTube or on the website, uh, churchofjesuschrist.org. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll have to go get that a, li a listen. And yeah. I wish we had more time tonight to listen to more of your experiences. Oh, goodness. Yeah. I, mean, I wish we, we could go chronologically. Talking. Let's, yeah. Uh, the next question <laughs> that comes from Cole Christensen. He says, Hank, what is the greatest life lesson that you could share with the youth in these tough times? Oh my goodness. These are such good questions that deserve so much time, right? Um, okay. For, uh, for teenagers, I think, uh, oh goodness, I'm, I've got about four or five I would choose. So I'll just choose one. Um, I would say this. Oftentimes we think when we are young that we can't make a difference. Uh, because we're little, right? And the the big important people in the world, the kings and senators and presidents, they're the ones that make the difference. The adults, they're the one that, that make the difference. We just have to wait until we're an adult and then maybe we can make a difference. But what we don't realize is that the world has changed one person at a time. It has to be changed one person at a time. In fact, anybody who's ever changed the world has only been one person. Um, I've never seen one person say, I'm 10 people and change the world. Everybody who's changed the world has been just one person and they've done it a person at a time. So the greatest lesson I think I could give to a teenager or one of the greatest lessons I think I could give it to a teenager is lift up your head and start looking for ways to change the lives of the people around you because they're there. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait till you're 18 or an adult or you have a career. You can start in your own junior high. You can start in your own high school and start looking around because there are people who need your light. There are people who need your smile. There are people who need your friendship uh, and your example. And you can change the world uh, through a person at a time. That's the way the Savior does it too. How's that? Is that all right? That sounds like a great answer to me. Okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get into our next question. And that is from Cole Godfrey. And he asked, Hank, what is your advice in finding those divine experiences and seeing those miracles daily? Ooh, Cole, what a great question. I have noticed as I've studied, um, as I've studied this idea that we talked about just with the question before last of uh, the tender mercies of the Lord, I have noticed that oftentimes the tender mercies of the Lord happen more often for me and for others when they are engaged in the Lord's work. Um, so when I am looking to see what he would have me do on the earth, I feel like those miracles come more frequently. When I'm more focused on building the kingdom of Hank uh, or when I'm you know, all about, hey, I'm going to focus on me, I, they seem to happen less and less frequently. So number one, I would say get involved in 
the Lord's work in any way, whatever that might look like in your life. Second, I, um, I would say that you have to invite him in. I have noticed that the Lord rarely interferes in our life unless he is invited. He's such a polite person, such a polite guest that he needs to be invited in. So I would encourage anyone to kneel down and say, hey, um, God, uh, this weird Hank guy said, I need to invite you into my life. So um, consider yourself invited. Uh, I'll leave the door open. Uh, Then watch. Then watch. Don't. Don't expect something in your timing. Uh, Just watch and be patient and wait. And I promise you, it will happen. So I think those two things combined will increase the likelihood um, that you're going to start seeing the Lord's hand more often. Another one would be probably to record it. Because I think when we write things down or type them up on a computer, the Lord knows we take them seriously, uh, that we want to remember them. And I think he'll give them more because because we've been good stewards with our experiences. Wow. Uh, I don't know if you got a copy of the questions before or something, but these answers have been incredible. You're, you're nice. <laughs> Let's uh, just keep on going then, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I can go as long as you want me to here. Next question comes from uh, Katie Pace Courier. And she says, what is your best advice for teaching children in the home who are not part of the church? What do you feel is most important other than being a role model? Katie, thank you. What a what a brilliant question. I'm grateful for that. Uh, you know, much of the gospel, um, the Lord has, I think, been good to us uh, in that much of the gospel is not always tied to him. So we can still teach honesty and integrity. We can still teach kindness. Now, all of these things are part of the gospel, but they're not necessarily tied to him or to a religion, which I'm grateful for because it enables us to have some flexibility with those of who maybe aren't part of the church, aren't part of a religion or have you know, guardians, a uh, stepfather or stepmother who don't want them uh, to be part of that or, a, you know, a, a divorced parent, something like that. So I think the Lord's given us a lot of f- flexibility uh, in that we can still teach gospel principles, even though we don't maybe throw the tag of religion onto it. So that's one way. I think the second way, and probably obviously the most important thing, Katie, you know this as well as I do, uh, is to love our children um, and to love a child is not to necessarily try to fix them or shape them, even though we are, we're trying, right? Uh, But uh, to lead them, um, uh, one of my favorite quotes from comes from a, uh, a man in the 1800s. His name was Joseph Fielding Smith. And he said, if you want your children to love you and to listen to you, he said, weep with them, get down on a knee, look them in the eye, try to understand them. Um, He said, so often we try to fix our children or shape our children or use harsh means to get them to do what is right. I've never seen someone punished into doing something right. I've never seen, I've never, maybe elders, I don't know about you, but I've never seen someone uh, threatened or punished into righteousness. Uh, I Mostly righteousness and the choice to follow Christ come as a result of someone's love, uh, someone's unconditional love for us. Uh, So Katie, I'm sure you already do this as a mother, but I'm going to try to um, get down on eye level with my kids, uh, give them attention and time, put my phone away, uh, and just show them with my actions um, that I love them more than anything else in this world. Absolutely. Is that okay, elders? You can fix anything I say. You can be like, no, cut that. Well, this is this is your time to shine, so <laughs> I think we'll let that stay. <clears throat> we'll get into the next question. Okay. Um, it's from Alexis Steinbrecher. And she says, what are your lifeline scriptures to help you get through hard times and why? Oh, Alexis, what a great question. What are my life li- lifeline scriptures? I have um, quite a few. Uh, so I'll just give you the ones that come to mind. Um, I, I, like I said, I teach the New Testament at BYU. And so uh, I spend a lot of time uh, there. And there's this, um, there's this one, uh, most people know this story about the woman taken in adultery and she's kind of thrown in front of the savior. And uh, he, he is able to, to help her out and uh, get rid of the people who were bullying her there. Uh, and then right after that story, uh, this is what he says. He says, then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I love that the theme of our fireside tonight is walk in the light uh, because that 
the Savior described himself that way. I will give you the light of life. And so I try to ponder that idea of, am I walking in darkness right now or do I have the light of life? And it seems anytime that I focus on him, the light gets stronger. Um, you know, anytime you, 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 you face, think about this, anytime you face a source of light, like the sun or a big bright lamp, okay? Anytime you face that, the darkness of life falls behind you right? It's, it's behind you. If you got your back turned to the source of the light, it's nothing but darkness in front of you, right? Your shadow falls in front of you. So I have found as I turn my life and my actions and my attitude and my, you know, how I fill my time, as I face the sun, uh, S-O-N, um, all the darkness of life uh, seems to fall behind me. Um, I, we could, we could keep going. I have, uh, many others, uh, of course, Romans 1 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is one, uh, that I love. And then if we open up the book of Mormon, um, I could show you a hundred more, uh, but, uh, maybe I'll, I'll make a list, Alexis, for you. Just shoot me an email. <laughs> That's great. I love, I personally love that one Romans too. Yeah. Uh, and we'll go ahead and keep moving on with the questions. Okay. Yeah. This next one is from Denise Rubel. She says, what is so special about Easter to you? Oh, Denise, thank you so much for this question. Um, Easter has become more important than Christmas to me. Um, I love Christmas, by the way. Christmas is a pure joy, especially when you have little children. Um, but Easter to me has become the holiday of all holidays uh, because the, the baby Jesus I adore, uh, but the resurrected Lord is who I worship. Um, so. I think Easter has changed for me, and I think for most people who lose someone close to them. About three months ago, my oldest brother passed away from COVID, um, and uh, that was that was a rough time for us. Although I think it was the best possible thing that could happen for him. I know that sounds crazy and and difficult, but you'll just have to trust me on that. I think it's uh, we in our doctrine we say that. Um, the the spirits of those who pass away go to a place uh, called the spirit world where they can still learn and be taught uh, and repent. Um, so uh, I, I just if you if you kind of understand where I'm coming from there, I think it's just the best possible place for him. But when we on this side of that lose people close to us, like I said, my father a couple of weeks ago, Easter changes. Um, Easter used to be about candy and eggs and, and springtime, which I still enjoy all of those, by the way, uh, God made chocolate for a reason. And that reason is happiness. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I would say that when I, when I sit and quietly on Easter morning and ponder the reality of the resurrected Lord and the fact, and I would say, this is a fact, uh, that I will see my brother, my father, my grandparents, I will see my mother-in-law who I just absolutely adore when I, I know for a fact that I will see and laugh and talk and, um, and just enjoy the presence of them again. Uh, Easter, wow. Easter becomes the celebration of that future reunion. And to me, there's, there's nothing better. What a powerful holiday Easter is. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. You got it. We're going to go ahead and go into our next question now. Okay. And that is from Caden Heslop. And he asks, what's some advice of how to align our plans with God's plans? Oh, that is such a, oh, that's, that's such a good question. In fact, I think you've come to uh, maybe one of the most difficult parts of just life in general. And that is um, when, how do I, how do I make these two things line up. I don't know if any of you ever remember, those of you who are a little bit older like me, if you were born in the 1900s, uh, you'll remember uh, a thing called a stick shift in a car. Uh, and if you remember those, um, if you're driving ever, if you're driving a stick, they still make them, but not, not nearly as often as they used to. Um, the gears would sometimes grind. Do you remember that? The gears would sometimes grind. You would let your foot off the clutch and the gears would come together in the transmission and you could hear them. They weren't lined up. It was right. Uh, uh, but other times, and drive. this is why driving a stick shift is so fun. When those gears line up and you're in the right gear, you can really just, oh, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of power there. Well, I would say the same thing with um, our lives and, and the Lord's plans, right? That when they aren't lined up, you'll, you'll feel it, right? You'll feel the grinding. It's just, you know, you'll, you'll almost hear it. Just the, oh, this isn't, life is not working, right? I'm not, 
I'm not taking off. I'm not zooming. Things aren't happening for me. What do I need to do to adjust? And usually if you ask the Lord that question, the bad news, the good news is he'll tell you. The bad news is he'll tell you. Um, and then it's up to us to say, am I willing to give up certain things? The Lord is always asking for us to give up things. And I, I don't know why, right? I, I would love it if the Lord's like, hey, get in a hammock and swing in Hawaii and I'm going to take care of you. But uh, the Lord often says, okay, if you want to get more aligned with me, let's give up some of these things that aren't from me, that aren't uh, leading you to me, right? Um, if I'm sitting watching my Netflix show uh, for, you know, a full season every day and I absolutely adore it, that's great. But it might not be aligning me with God. And I might be able to feel that at the end of the day going, I don't really feel like I took off today, right? Uh, yet when I put myself towards this, the effort of saying, okay, what would God want me to do? And there's so many things. I don't think God's like, here's the one thing you should do. I think the Lord's given us a, a variety of things we can do to be part of his work. Uh, then all of a sudden you'll feel it just, boom, you'll feel it take off like that. So if anybody here feels, and again, I, this isn't about mental illness by any means, right? Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in medication and therapy and all of that. So when I say this, this, I'm not talking about depression or anxiety in their, uh, medical, you know, condition. I'm just talking about when you can kind of feel, uh, this, what I would call divine discontent that you and the Lord are not just, you're just not lined up. You've got some ideas and goals that, you know, he does not have in mind for you. When you give those up, I think you'll be able to feel it click. You'll be able to feel it go and, and uh, things, will, uh, things will take off for you. That's not to say that it won't be steep, right? There will be some difficulties along the way. Uh, but uh, what will happen is, is actually inside of you. Uh, you'll be able to feel that, um, that unity with God. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that's, a pretty exciting, uh, that's a pretty exciting feeling. Is that, is that okay, elders? Did I do a good job? That was great. That was I, I. I haven't ever driven stick shift, but I really like that analogy. <laughs> you got to be born in the 1900s. Yeah. Yeah. It really made me grateful for our automatic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you ever drive one, you'll be excited. You'll be like, "Oh, I'm not going back." I, yeah, I don't probably it's ruin a, the it's car. It's a fun too, thing. We'll go ahead and hop right into the next question. Okay. And that comes from Carmen Conti, and she asks: As your children get older and more involved in their personal lives, how do you what? What do you do to continue to keep the family together and united and committed to the gospel? Oh, Carmen, that, oh, if you figure that out, you let me know too. Okay, Carmen, but I'll tell you what I try to do. So um, <clears throat> my doctorate degree was uh, focused on high trust relationships. And the one way to, to have a high trust relationship with anyone, including your child, is to spend time with them to spend time with them. Um, and it, it, the, the time that you spend with them just needs to have a couple of characteristics, right? It needs to be frequent, needs to be positive, uh, it needs to be low risk, meaning I'm not, you know, trying to fix you. I just am spending time with you and enjoying our, you know, your presence and our time together, uh, right? If, if, if I'm doing that and it's built into our family structure. So let me give you one example, Carmen. Uh, when our kids were little, my, uh, my mom, she'll be mad at me that I said that. My wife and I decided that on each day of um, the month of which their, the child has a, uh, the birthday date. So let's say, take for example, my daughter, she's 17. Um, she was born on February 20th. And so the 20th of every month is a day that she knows that she and I, or she and I and my wife, or she and my wife are going to spend together. Uh, and that day is hers and she gets to choose what we do most of the time. And uh, it can't be super expensive, but it, it is her day. Well, as we build up that frequent time together, we build a relationship, right? And then when it time, comes time for a gospel moments, gospel discussion, they happen during those times. It's not like our greatest gospel discussions happen when we get together and say, okay, let's have a gospel discussion. That usually doesn't happen. Usually it's just like, you stop moving, stop breathing, stop doing it. You guys are just a hold still, right? Um, the greatest gospel discussions I've had with my children are on those times when I'm just 
hanging out with them, uh, when we're just talking, when we're fishing, when we are uh, going out to eat together. Those are the greatest times I've had those gospel discussions because maybe, I don't know, they're a little more relevant uh, to them in their lives, especially as they get older, they have concerns and questions. And because we've spent so much time together, they naturally come to us. I've noticed, uh, Carmen, that when that when I haven't spent time with them, when it's been, you know, the 20th of the month and it's always been my daughter and my wife, my daughter, and my wife, I'm busy. I've got something to do. You know, I'm, I'm doing something um, that she's not likely to come to me uh, because I haven't put in the work to spend that frequent, personal, positive, you know, low risk time with her. So Carmen, there's a lot of things to, that can answer that question, but I would say build into your family structure time together one-on-one -on -one, uh, with your children. I hope that helps. Wonderful advice. Thank you. Let's see what next questions we have. You got it. Um, it's by Bold Gledhill. And they've asked, who has been the greatest example in your life to get you where you are today? <laughs> My goodness. These questions are so hard, right? Like, Okay. Um, the greatest example. Oh man. I mean, I'm just, I'm nervous. I'm not going to say the right person because there's so many. Um, I think uh, if, if those of you who have read the Book of Mormon, it actually starts out with a verse by a, a prophet named Nephi. And he says, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. Now, this kid could, he's done a lot by the time he writes this stuff down. He's built a boat. He's become king of his people. He has fought in wars. He could say, I, Nephi, king of my people. I, Nephi, uh, you know, warrior in battle. I, Nephi, builder of ships, right? Whatever. He could, he could say anything he wants. Uh, he says, I, Nephi, born of goodly parents. So I think um, just the question uh, there, I like it because it's, it's acknowledging that other people have helped me get to where I am. That's just that acknowledgement, right? And then you can start listing the people. Um, I would say, of course, uh, is my wife. Um, Sarah and I have a, uh, we don't have a perfect relationship. I'm not one of these people that stands up in church and says, my wife and I, we've never fought, right? We've never, never had an argument. When people say that, I'm like, wow, do you talk? Uh, because we have had arguments. We have, you know, it's, we, I, I feel like we're pretty normal that way. I hope so anyway. Usually don't throw things. But um, as we have committed to each other over the last 21 years, uh, it has been uh, the most glorious experience of coming closer together and then learning from her. Um, just learning the way she interacts with our children, uh, people in the neighborhood, watching her and her work ethic. Um, I, to me, that is by far the greatest example. And she has sacrificed the most to get me uh, anywhere where I am in my career. Uh, by far, she has uh, done more uh, than anyone else. But uh, there are many others, mentors, teachers I've had along the way. Um, a mission president, um, you know, all of all of those. So I think acknowledging that you've you've you are where you are because of others uh, is an essential part of success, uh, real success. I kind of look at you guys when I'm done. Like here you go. <laughs> I love that. Uh, just all those people that join together to influence your life and yeah. make you the man that you are today. Yeah, and I hope I'm somebody like that to others. Right. Oh, I sure. hope that someone would list me that uh, as someone who's influenced them for good and help them succeed. Oh, yeah. I'm, you've definitely influenced me tonight. So that's a least one. But we'll, nice. we'll move into get try and get a few more questions. In okay. Yeah. No problem. Next one comes from Colton Gardner. He says, Hank, tragically, our world is polluted with anti messiah ideologies. Yes. How can we walk in light in the midst of the vast darkness? Oh, Colton, you are so right. You are so right. And it gets discouraging sometimes. Um, I admit that I have had times where I get discouraged by uh, just watching the news um, that I just think, oh, really? Uh, you know, how do you fight something against, how do you fight something that big and that massive and that evil? Um, for me personally, uh, I think there's a power um, that comes into, like we talked about earlier, being aligned with Christ. Uh, in New York City, 
uh, there is one of our temples. Uh, those of you who are, are members of our church but are listening, you probably have seen a Latter-day Saint uh, temple before. There's one in Boston right off the side of the freeway, beautiful building. Um, and uh, in, there's one in downtown New York, downtown Manhattan, right, right there. Um, and you can be in that temple and not hear a single thing that is going on outside. Buses, taxis, right? Music. You cannot hear a single thing that is going on outside. And it's only 10 yards away. Uh, and how is it possible that you could be in that building and have complete peace? And yet all of that hustle and bustle and craziness is happening just, you know, 30 feet away. And it's in the construction of the building. Uh, the building is uh, built inside of another building. Uh, and they're connected at very few points because sound needs, you know, uh, matter to travel through. Uh, and so they're only connected at a very, uh, very, a couple of points and it absorbs all the sound. Well, I think Colton, um, I, I, I obviously don't want to be naive and not informed. Uh, however, we can be, I think, over-informed about the darkness around us, and we can focus on it too much, be too connected to it, and that allows it to come into our life. So I am, I, I personally, uh, and you could totally disagree with me in this and it'd be totally fine, um, but I personally try not to be too connected to those things. Um, I do want to be informed. And as soon as I feel like I am informed uh, and I know, you know, what we're fighting against, uh, I disconnect myself from that world and then uh, try to have the power to, to you know, influence uh, the people around me. Um, one of the great worries I think we can have as uh, Christians trying to help the world become brighter with more light, uh, I think one of the major problems we can have is, is discouragement or thinking will never be able to change anything. It can be so, uh, you know, just so overwhelming that we think, well, I'm not making a difference. Uh, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, the difference that you're going to make is going to happen an individual at a time. It's going to happen a neighbor at a time. Uh, it's going to happen in your interactions on the street. It's going to happen in your interactions in the store, right? That's uh, the, the small, good uplifting things that are full of light that you do every day, that's where your greatest impact will lie. Uh, and that, uh, you, you don't want to get discouraged from doing those little things, right? It, it might be so overpowering that you become hard-hearted and you're not, you're not willing to do the small little things that actually make the biggest difference. So I personally would disconnect from that darkness as much as I can, um, yet still be an informed Christian uh, and then work individually with, you know, those around me, uh, to fill their lives with light. Absolutely. Okay. Elders. Make sure that we break up with the world where we can. Hey, yeah. You've heard that talk. You're <laughs> so nice. Awesome. Unfortunately, we're on our last question for the night. Okay. We'll just dive right into that. And it's from Connor K and he's asked, how do you help your friends that are struggling without putting yourself in spiritual danger? Ooh, Connor, such an important question. Um, so often we want to help others, but then we end up putting ourselves in a, in a difficult spot, right? Uh, so I'll give you a couple of analogies. Uh, I fly a lot where I used to, uh, back before the uh, COVID, uh, pandemic. And I always, I knew the routine at the beginning of the flight. Uh, and one of those was if you're traveling with a small child and we need our oxygen masks, I bet all of you can, if you've ever had a flight, you can say what they're going to say next. Put your mask on first before trying to help someone else. Uh, and that's the case. So you don't, you know, in your effort to put uh, an oxygen mask on one of your children, you pass out and nobody gets an oxygen mask. So the idea there, I think, spiritually is to put your own spirituality on first. Make sure it is secure and firm before you go and try to help someone else. Second, I would say it's very difficult, um, especially for a young person, uh, to uh, it's it's impossible for a young person to force someone into goodness, right? We want to so badly. Uh, but think of it this way. If I'm on like a gymnastics balance beam and up here, it is awesome on this balance beam. And I want my friend to come up on the balance beam with me. Um, is it going to be easier for them to pull me off or me to pull them on? Right. The only way they're going to come on to this balance beam is if they want to. Uh, it's going to be impossible for me to force them on, but it's going to be very easy for them to pull me off of there. Uh, so 
that leads to my next point, which is I wouldn't do this alone. Uh, when I personally want to, let's say there's a couple that I really want to help. I think they're just putting themselves in a difficult spot and I love them. I will invite them to come with me and my wife and maybe two or three other couples who are filled with light. So now we've got, we've got numbers basically. And so now they feel like, Hey, they're in, they're part of this group. Uh, and I want them to feel the light of all of these wonderful couples around them. Does that make sense? So I would say, uh, instead of you going one-on-one -on -one this way and they're maybe being pulled off the balance beam, uh, to get yourself four or five, if you can, uh, a handful of these friends who are all full of light and then bring one in. So much easier for four or five friends to help someone than possibly the one-on-one -on -one where you might be putting yourself uh, in a difficult spot. Does that help elders, you think? Perfect. Thank you so much for that right, answer, for, for all the answers that you've given tonight. You got it, brother. I wish, Anytime. I wish we had more time, but uh, unfortunately, we have to, to move on with the devotional. And we're, we're going to end things off here with a, a closing musical number by Crystal Calm, followed by a closing prayer by Elder George Krunkel. Uh, and following that, uh, we'll bring you back on screen and you can uh, say any closing, closing thoughts that you have. Sure, sure. We'll say goodbye to everyone. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity we have had to listen to Brother Smith tonight. We're grateful for his message. We're grateful to come unto thee. We're grateful to be inspired to know thee better and to follow thy ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks again for that musical number and that prayer. That was awesome. And now, Hank. The time is yours for any closing remarks. <laughs> I don't know what to do at this point. We could just have a lot of fun, I guess. We could just tell stories uh, <laughs> with each other. Where? Uh, let's see. Where are you from, Elder Fellows? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Sacramento, California. Sacramento, California. California. And how long have you been on your mission? Uh, I've been out for uh, almost nine months now. Nine months. Beautiful. All right, Elder Jensen. 
Yep, Elder Jensen. I'm from Taylorsville, Utah. I have about 15 months. 15 months you've been out on your mission. All right. Uh, that is just so wonderful. You know, I miss being a missionary. I know that it's odd to say that because uh, it's definitely difficult. Um, but uh, man, I miss those days uh, of just, you know, I remember the very first time uh, I was, I, I flew in, I was, I went, I served my mission in California in Fresno and um, I remember the very first time I walked into a cafe with uh, a group of missionaries and everybody looked at us and I was, I did not know why, right? Because I'd, I'd walked into many cafes in my life and nobody had looked at us, right? I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but man, we were getting lots of whispers and looks and, and I thought, what is going on? Um, why is everybody looking? And I even asked the missionaries, I think I'd been in the mission field like two days and I said, why is everybody looking at us? And he said, oh, that happens everywhere we go, right? And I was, I thought, oh, okay. Uh, and I got so used to it. Have you guys gotten used to it? Uh, I, I got so used to it that when I got home from my mission and walked into a cafe, I was kind of offended that nobody like <laughs> pointed and whispered, like nobody even cared uh, that I had walked into that restaurant. I was like, oh, hey, hey, come on. I wanna, I wanna be whispered about. Uh, so being a missionary is such a, it was, you know, when you look back on it, it's such a fascinating thing to do. Right. But so joyful. I, I just, there were times that, that I was so, so joyful. And I don't know if anybody's still listening to us elders, but I'll tell you this. The one thing I was not prepared for as a missionary, I was prepared to have doors slammed in my face and it happened. Uh, I was prepared for some people to be upset and I got spit on a couple of times and uh, one guy chased us with a baseball bat. So, I mean, I, I expected that and I expected uh, people to receive our message uh, and they did. And that was amazing. The one thing I wasn't prepared for, which I still, um, that still kind of broke me uh, and still breaks me to this day was when I would make really close friends with someone I was teaching and it was just going very well. And uh, they were loving coming to Christ. They were feeling it. We were feeling it. We were all learning together. And then they, uh, for some reason or another, and I, I, you know, they just allowed someone to come in and, and derail them off that path. Uh, fear or someone comes in and and, you know, says this and this about the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, which is full of half truths and lies and, uh, you know, out of context statements, anything. And uh, that journey was derailed. I'll tell you, elders, I was not prepared for that. Um, it broke my heart. Uh, not just be, not because I was like, oh, good, we're going to get this person in the church. We're going to, I, uh, you know, they would, they would call, they probably text now, but they would call and say, um, thank you so much for all you've done. I'm no longer interested. And that was it. That was the end of the story. Uh, and of course, we want to maintain that boundary, right? We want to maintain that boundary and say that happens. But oh, did that hurt? It still hurts to think about. It's just just life. But thank goodness we have our Savior. To, yeah, to yeah. And you know, you you hope that that there's another missionary who can maybe do a better job along the way. But my goodness. Uh, that hurt a lot. Sorry to cut you off, Hank, but that's all the time that we have for tonight. Oh, I gotta go. Okay, bye, bye everyone. everyone. You have. We'll see you all next Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and we'll see you then. All right.